Are two Jeffs better than one? We're going to find out. We're going to talk all things scouting, draft, and Guardians prospects with Jeff Ponce of Baseball America. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today. You're going to get $150 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I actually had a debate with Justin. Uh, I don't want to loop myself into this just because I have a, a ja sound at the beginning of my name. But if you think about it, you know, Jeff Fonts is joining us, who's is fantastic. But we also, in recent history, have people like J.J. Cooper, John Manuel, Jim Callis. Uh, it does feel like... Uh, Having a ja or or ga sound would be, uh, you know, I, I'm sure this is what we call uh, correlative, not causative data. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, there is a history of it. Uh, and thank you to Jeff for joining us. Yeah, it's like a, it's like the uh, I'm from New England, so I'm going to use a Patriots reference. I'm sorry, but it's like the Pats drafting like Rutgers players. You just it, it was eventually yeah. you knew it was going to happen. They always had to have at least two guys from Rutgers in the team. So. A days gone by no longer with bill belichick out the door we have that in common that's fair our franchises have both fired bill belichick kind of <laughs> well the one team had a little more success than the other so <laughs> things weren't quite the same I but think, sure I, we can we can go that route i think there was an irish quarterback from uh northern california that might have had an impact on some of those points in the long run i think we're seeing that a little bit now I don't know if we're going to talk about him on, on a uh, Ohio-based show. We probably shouldn't go there. <laughs> um, real quickly, too, before we, we get into this, because I, I wanted to we wanted to have you on because I think you do a great job writing about prospects, and you also blend scouting and data together very well. Like I've learned a lot from running from reading your articles, like just what metrics matter, and and explaining things like you know vertical approach angle and just different metrics that I I quite didn't understand before and. I had to learn a lot from, from reading you, but first, if you're comfortable with it, I wanted to tell, also say like, people might not be familiar with your story. Like you, we were talking before this and I already knew this, but like, you know, you were one of the founders of prospects live. We kind of crossed paths there a little bit, but you were writing for a long time and had a, a day job and you got a family and, and now you're baseball America. And that ha didn't happen for yeah. you like overnight, but I just think it's a cool story because like you grinded for a long time doing something everybody, you know, Jeff and I do and everybody else wishes they could do, but, you know, you grinded for a long time and, and now here you are, you're, you know, in your dream job. That's such a cool story. I feel like people don't really recognize. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I was, I was really lucky and really fortunate. Um, I think to come into this space at the right time, uh, when there was just a big explosion and interest in prospects. And I think, you know, my sort of like way in was really talking about fantasy initially. And, um, you know, what happened was I just, like anything, I think you get into something, you really like it, you're getting a good response. And like, I just wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn more about the things that maybe I didn't understand. At that point, it might have been, you know, scouting or certain metrics that were available at the time, which are not the same sort of things that are, are available now. Um, but just going to games and going through that process. And that kind of led me to getting into the draft and the amateur side of things. And, you know, um, I had gone to Cape Cod League games pretty much my whole life, but more as a fan than somebody that was scouting and uh, started to just utilize that being in my backyard and just this crazy deep cache of prospects every year that, you know, um, there's a good chance if somebody played college baseball, I probably got to see him once or twice in the Cape. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's an advantage just seeing those players. And I started to got kind of get into more of the, the scouting, the real life side of things. Um, you know, I started Prospects Live with uh, Matt Thompson, who's still there. He's the only original founder that's still around. Uh, Jason Panini, who worked for the Twins for a little bit. Uh, Jason Waddell, who was an excellent prospect writer who stepped away. Um, and Lance Brozdowski actually was one of the original guys as well. I don't know if people realize that. Um, so we just had this really incredibly talented team. And we just had so many people that came through um, in those first few years that went on to work for teams as scouts and analysts and, you know, 
uh, billion dollar agencies as, as analysts and scouts and all these different areas. Um, it's just really cool to see, you know, obviously Lance went on and did his thing uh, and all the stuff that he does uh, on the Cubs broadcast, the Yankees broadcast. I don't know if he's, I'm sure he's going to pop up on MLB broadcast pretty soon. Um, and I, you know, I got an opportunity. I just kept grinding away. Uh, I always have a lot of ideas and, and I just like try to pursue them and see what I can do with it. And uh, you know, some, somehow haphazardly I, I turn out, decent content from time to time so <laughs> it, you know it worked out and um you know i think just having the experience have been like on the other side of it like creating a site and then building all that out and really having to just like you when you do that when you have a passion like we have for it uh, and you want to do content well um you have to focus so much time on it and effort and, and it's a, it's an obsession it's not it's <laughs> not something that's just like a job right um, and I'm fortunate enough that I had an opportunity to do something that I loved later on in my life. I mean, I was 40, 39 years old, a few months before my 40th birthday when I got, you know, my opportunity at Baseball America to do this full time. And so I just embrace it. And, you know, I say to JJ all the time, it's like, I'm, I'm running out into a major league field every day when I do this. It's like, you know, I know there's a million guys that would do this job for probably even less money than they pay me. And would do it well and would work their butts off you know um so i think that's one of the things when you have a job like this like you know i don't i don't make the money <laughs> that <laughs> athletes make not even close to it you know or anything like that but i do have this like pretty awesome job that every day i get to wake up and and talk and immerse myself in in baseball so yeah and it's back so i'm excited for that yeah um i wanted to ask you a little bit like how like some of the data that you look at and cause you're really good at writing about this stuff. Like, like I said, I learned a lot from, from reading your stuff on pitch metrics for fastballs, for sliders. And, and, you know, you're putting out a lot of stuff right now about exit velocity. I, your recent article about like what it, how it builds and guys as they age, but what are some of the important indicators like you look for when you're scouting? Cause like I said, I think you do a good job blending the scouting side and incorporating the data so we get a lot of questions from people that are like, you know, explain this metric or explain what you're talking about here. And and we we try to explain it, you know, as best as we can. But I think you have a better grasp on it sometimes because obviously you write about it a lot. But what are some of like in hitting and pitching? I know it's it's kind of a, a vague question, but what are some of the indicators and metrics that like really you are looking at when you're going to write about a player? And, and this is what makes makes a player pop for you or what, what's really important for you to look at? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's like, I, I try to put on different hats and, you know, I certainly have the, the scouting side of things and then looking at more advanced data and analytics. And a lot of that was just my desire to be able to put a number that's objective onto certain traits that are good and like understand and connect the dots. Like I, I wanted to be able to like the reason I started learning about trackman day, I swear to God, is sitting behind the home plate at Katuit in the Cape. And I was sitting next to a 19 year old kid coming off a sophomore year at Holy Cross. His name is Peter Flaherty. He now works at Baseball America. We hired him. Okay. He was the main trackman guy at uh, the Cape that year. It was a different setup than it is now. And so it was the first time I met Peter and it was watching Nick Gonzalez of all players, actually uh, funny enough. Um, Casey Schmidt was on that team and Matt Mervis. Those were all in the field wow. at the same time. So um, amongst other guys too. And um, I'm looking at these numbers come off the machine. I'm just looking at velocity. I'm like, all right, I can get velo here. I don't have to put a gun up. Like this is great. <laughs> coming off the trackman. And I'm seeing the spin rates and I know spin rates and what's good and what's bad. But I don't, that was the point where I think we just talked in spin rates. Like we didn't really know what it meant. And um, I saw these other numbers coming off and, you know, next year pandemic happens and, you know, we're sort of shuttered in or whatever. And uh, I had another guy who at the time was a student at UC USC who worked for us, really smart guy with metrics. And I just like asked questions and was like, I don't know. And I almost like, he gave me an opportunity to more or less like be wrong. He would share information, he would have me break stuff down and I would get it wrong and be like, this is why it's wrong. And eventually, like, you kind of figure out, like, certain traits and things that are good 
and what plays up. And then, you know, I got access to, to more information and more data on the minor league side and the college side and was really able to like dig in and kind of study what looks good, what doesn't. And I think the thing that over three years now looking at this stuff, I've started to come back to very traditional scouting roles, like where I feel like a lot of those roles can be like bucketed and explained by looking at data. So getting back to the main question here, when I look at pitchers and I look at hitters, it's different things. From like a numbers perspective, just like blank data on a page, you know, I'm obviously, I'm going to look at the impact first. I want to know what the 90th percentile exit velocity is. The reason I look at 90th percentile is number one, max EVs at the minor league level are very flaky. I've seen 144s for guys that definitely have never hit a ball 110. All right. Like there's some misreads. Yeah. It gets into the data. All the 90th percentile numbers that you get, like I get, are washed. So they're cleaned. And it's the top 10% of all the batted balls together. And it's the average of those. So it's really looking at like what the high end, when this player hits his power capacity, what does it look like? Um, and so, you know, I always look at that. I, that's impact for me, I just think is the most important thing. And then I can kind of go from there. It doesn't mean I, I won't like the player. You don't have to have set 60 or 70 impact for me to think you could be a 50 or better, but I go from there. And then I'm going to look at like zone contact because for me, zone contact, the reason I like it is it's isolated. It's looking out when you swing at strikes, you swing at good pitches. Not all strikes are good to hit, but generally you swing at good pitches. How frequently do you miss? Right. So that gives me a, a true understanding of real contact skill. Because when you look at an overall contact rate, chase swings are, are baked into that. And so if it's a younger hitter who's maybe a little bit overzealous, maybe some of his whiff comes into play because he chases out of the zone. Some of that can be coached away. Some of that, and this is another article I'll probably put out, eventually, eventually players sort of grow out of it. Um, they, they, have, they evolve from a skill perspective. Skills continue to get better as players play into their deep 30s they continue to get better um power doesn't power seems to peak at 23 24. um we see that in the minor league data jeff zimmerman put an article up on fan graphs this week that's great i think it was actually like maybe the same day i put mine out just as luck would have it and he looked at it from the major league side of things and like power plateaus at like 25 like evs plateau at 25 launch angles get better contact gets better chase rates get better etc but power kind of plateaus and i think you see where the growth is in this article and so that's to me that the numbers are fine you know the players that I, I i highlighted are fine whatever i think the real like interesting part of this article to me is the fact that we have this average of all of these minor leaguers at these age all these guys that are between 17 and 23 are pretty much still prospects there's nobody in there it's really an np um and you know 96.5 at 17 and then you look, you know, when someone's 21 years old, it's 101.3. It's a, it's a significant jump. We don't see another jump like that in, you know, any amount of time, even like a 10 going to your pick up players 30s. We typically don't see the average have that sort of jump. And I think that's easily explained when you're thinking about 17, 18 year old, 19 year old players that are coming into pro ball. A lot of these guys haven't been on a training regiment. Some of them play multiple sports. I hear stories all the time still where there's guys that were like, he never really lifted weights. Marcelo Meyer had never really lifted weights. When you're 6'3 and you're pretty strong, you kind of don't need to, you know, like, yeah. okay. And I, I think that that's what happens too, is guys see significant jumps when they're on different training regiments. And I think there's a different conversation to be had about capacity and being able to identify that. And I think there's a lot of funny traits that, correspond really well with high-end power hitting and capacity. And I think there's some athleticism that's actually tied to it. Like if you even look at a guy like Jordan Alvarez, who's a massive human being, the reason he is the hitter he is and the power hitter he is, he is because he does have like rotational acceleration that's just unlike other players, you know? Um, so I think that's a lot of, like I'm at the ballpark, I'm looking at athletes. I'm trying right. to see guys that do things explosively and move well even on the mound i'm looking for guys that move well it's easy you know ease of operation and able to do things like you know easy, easily be explosive maybe is the best way to put it concisely but that makes yeah sense. i think there's a lot of different metrics that you can look at 
but um, you know, in the end, it's 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 how do these metrics come together to create this player? You know, and there's a balance. There can't be too much whiff, but you don't want a guy to be too passive. You know, you don't want a guy that maybe like to me. I was saying this earlier today. I could look at two different players and you can give me a guy and say, hey, one guy has an 81 percent contact rate in zone or overall, and the other guy has a 74 percent contact rate. And, and really at like 74, 75%, there's kind of diminishing returns on contact. Really at that right. point, I want to know, do you walk? Do you work? Account, <laughs> do you make a lot of impact? And do you make impact at good angles? You know, that's the kind of stuff that matters. Yeah. All right. We'll get into more stuff with metrics, draft, and maybe some Guardians prospects just in a moment. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. What about some stuff on the Cape? Everyone in Cleveland right now, I think, is uh, after the first two weeks of college baseball, is on the Travis Bazana train. I mean, I, I'm i on the Nick Kurtz bandwagon, but the first two weeks of, uh, of college ball, it's it's all, you know, the Travis Bazana show. So you saw him a lot on the Cape last year. Um, are you surprised by the early season success and, and just kind of go through what you saw last summer? You could tell me this guy's a Hall of Famer. I wouldn't be surprised. I, like, I, I got to be honest. I've never been around a player like Travis Bazana. Um, I've never seen a player with a work ethic like Travis Bazana. It's a legendary mentality. That's uh, the separator to me. Right this there. is this what is you Brady. About? This is Kobe. This is like yeah, like I think that he's going to be a humongous star. I, I would I would take Travis Bazana unless one of the pitchers proves that they're the top guy. Like if Hagen Smith keeps doing this, I, I think that that's kind of interesting. Now, I don't, I mean, like the biggest question with Bazana is the slow throwing action is kind of weird in the outfield. I've seen him play the outfield, um, hmm. but he's one of Can these. Can you play center? That, like you could tell him his, like he could fix it like in a, a month. Like it, the things that uh, I've been exposed to Bazana since he first came over and, um, the work ethic on this guy, the things that he cares about. I saw this dude go three for four with a double that I thought was gone off the bat. It was like 103. So I see him after the game. Like, what's up, Travis? I had interviewed him a few times before. His agent is a friend of mine. And, um, you know, I met him. I had to him sign a bat for my son. I don't have anyone sign anything for anyone. But um, I know Travis a little bit. And uh, I'm like, dude, you smoked that double. 103 off the bat. He's like, yeah, man, you know, the balls don't fly out here like they do out in America. He's like, you know, I, I, I got to hit homers, man. Like, what the hell? And he was like, he was pissed. He just went three for four and like raked. I think he had two doubles that night. I read a double and a triple and a single and like st steals bases. Um, he's infectious. Like Falmouth is like the Mets of the Cape. They are loaded every year. The guy that was the commissioner up until this this past year is his last year uh, runs Falmouth. They are loaded. I mean, Tommy White was a commit at Falmouth. You name any big college prospect that goes to the national team, they probably committed there. Charlie Condon was there early on in the season. I mean, like, it, they're loaded. Every single year they're loaded. And so they always lose, though. They're always like a mediocre team. They're never that good. Zana came in, and I swear to God, like, they had no pitching and they made the playoffs and were like kind of hanging around. And I, I think it was because of Bazana. Like he just, he changes culture. I think this is a guy you could have up in the majors within a year. Um, and I just, you know, 
as far as much as as his body can possibly produce, he'll produce. And I mean, this weekend, he had a game where I think it was somebody Kylie tweeted it out, but I had seen it from his agent as well. Like he had four balls in the same game. They were 108 miles an hour. Um, you know, and over the last five years, there's like five prospects and it's all crazy power guys. If he's showing that level of power, and this is something that Bazana has built up to for three years, he did not, he was committed to Falmouth in 2022 and didn't go to the Cape. He went to driveline to work on bat speed. You saw the videos, the shit was videos ripping, you know, <laughs> swings. That's, that's what this guy eats, lives, sleeps, breathes baseball. And it's not just the approach in the field. The way he handled himself off the field for like an interview with the local TV news station. Most guys are showing up in their ball cap and their sweats, you know, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Most guys do that to come from the ball field. This dude put on like a button up white shirt, khakis. He's got the hairs done. He's got on, you know, loafers, you know, with no socks. Like he's just so ready for prime time and I think that like everything about this guy's life has built up to this moment. And it's just, I, I think Nick Kurtz is a really good prospect. I think JJ Weatherhalt is a really good prospect. I think the separator is the person. And I just think that Bazana is going to get whatever he can out of him. Cause he wants to win. It's more than just the money and all that. Like that dude is a different mentality and like Weatherhalt may have more gifts, you know, Nick Kurtz has a crazy combination of, size skill power i even think there's a chance you could play him in a corner outfield spot if you really wanted to um but uh, you know it's a first baseman still right it's a first baseman still and that kind of gives me pause um and whether halt is a shortstop and name only people are, he's a shortstop he's he, he's playing shortstop he's not going to play shortstop in the big league like that's not he's not playing anywhere right now but yeah he's not playing at all now and he's yeah. been hurt at points i mean he's a great talent like i think from like a pure talent perspective he's probably the best of the three um but i just i think bazan is a different breed that i wonder if if he ends up could you make him a center fielder he's got the speed to do it you know if you can get the throwing from the outfield down maybe he can do that i he's not a shortstop but um yeah i think just he's a different He's a different player. It's a culture guy. I think he brings a lot to the table. Um, and there's impact there. You know, great skills, good approach, and impact. I think so. I think he fits in from a skills perspective with the Guardians. And, you know, they've been trending more toward adding some impact bats. So I think you could we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what I, everybody, I think it's that like wants. 80 grade work ethic is like one of the things I know I've talked about on the show. And it's like, we had Will Benson here who had that as well, who, you know, had put in a lot of work over the years. And it's like yeah. when you get someone like like Travis, it seems like you put that work ethic on that skill set, it's hard to see it failing. And it's the mentality. I mean, it's beyond just the like there's a, a lot of guys work really hard. He's the kind of guy that handles things the right way for an athlete. Like from a psychological standpoint, he just consumes things differently and i don't think he cares about the outside world because he holds himself to such a high standard like it's like that kobe brady type of thing it's different from other players you know and other players have been around are great players you know guys that play in the major <laughs> leagues and are very good um he's just you know he's a different breed it's just it's all it's all baseball i mean you know he had to come to this country as a kid you know leave his yeah. family behind to come here and play i mean it's a different it was a different approach. He can't get any NIL deals because he's foreign. So that's oh, another thing that. people wow. don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. He I didn't know that. Eligible for NIL. Cleveland, Cleveland you know. does like the 80 grade makeup guys. Let's, uh, let's pay one more bill. Let's come back and see how much more content we can squeeze in the next few minutes here with uh, Jeff Bonds, who's been great. <laughs> well, it sounds like we should be making bets on Travis Mazana, but unfortunately, the Ohio, state of Ohio. There are no uh, player prop bets, but one thing you can bet on at FanDuel, if you are a new customer, you can get some buckets over on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. $150 bucks if your bet wins. So just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. They're not a $5 bet. Anything you feel good about. And if it wins, 
you get 150 born bucks to bet with on FanDuel. You can bet on NBA players and teams, quick bets, live same game parlays, those props that you can do in the NBA and not college right now, and more. So just visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown to shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Should we do more college? Should we should we talk about uh, some of the Guardians can, farm system? Can I throw out my favorite question to ask? Like when we get someone who obviously is this knowledgeable. Uh, so th- this is where I put you a little bit on the spot, but this always gets good response. Who is like, is do you have a a favorite favorite or maybe a guy who isn't like the number one, number two prospect who stands out with the Guardians? Like, is there someone who comes to mind that is like, oh, that's that's your dude in the system? Ooh, um, putting them on the spot here. This was not prep, so <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. Uh, I know the Guardians aren't one of your systems, but I mean, systems. I know, I know. They're, I they're not, maybe somebody you'd scouted yeah. before who's there. I mean, like, I you know, Chase Delauder has been my dude since the first time I saw him on the Cape. Um, so that's one guy that I think I would I would probably throw out there. Um, is Davenport still in the system? Aaron he Davenport is, is still system. here. Yeah, Aaron I, Davenport is in the system. I don't I've think he's so anything, many but I, I loved I loved watching Aaron, Dar- Aaron Davenport pitch the couple times that I've seen him. Um, he's just got a bunch of different shapes. He's got the blonde hair. Uh, it's kind of <laughs> it was fun. eighty grade flow, right? I mean, he's the one. It, it's, 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 it's great. It's great flow for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know. I, I haven't seen any of the international guys like we could talk draft guys or really like Andrew Walters a lot, really interesting fastball shape. I wrote a little bit about him right before the draft as somebody that I thought was uh, a really good pick. Um, I don't know. I mean, like hey, speaking I think of Andrew Walters, everybody, everybody not, probably not likes like Wolf, Wolf, but... Melvin Francisca, right? Like I don't think I'm yeah. alone on that one. What? Okay. You brought up Walters. We keep hearing this stuff about a slider. Like, you know, we, Jeff, I think you talked about it. Like we thought he was a one pitch pitcher, this fastball, but now we're seeing more stuff with the slider that maybe he didn't show in college with Walters. Do you, what do you know about the slider? I'll have to, I'd have to pull up the metrics. I don't have it in front of me. It's been a while since I looked at it. I didn't think it was bad in college. Um, I thought the numbers were pretty good. He's just got like an alien fastball shape. Yeah. You know, okay. Um, Fastball got him far, but I mean, he, you know, he's one of these guys that's kind of a pronator would feel for spin. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, if they worked on it a little bit, it could be kind of interesting. He's a hard thrower too. So I don't know. I'll have to look at what the slider is. I don't want to talk on a turn and <laughs> no. tell you that I know it. Okay. When, if it's different from what I have on data for me, you know, last spring, you know, I just seen a lot of varying opinions. That's all. And, yeah. And I know before we went on air, um, there were a lot of people who were kind of down on the Ralphie pick. And I know you had a few thoughts beforehand just to maybe help explain to people why, even though Ralphie, wasn't quite the big name as some of the people were hoping, but why Ralphie is a, a, I don't know if I want to say it, why Ralphie is an interesting addition to this system. Yeah. I mean, we'll see if he can catch or not. I mean, it's a huge arm. Like he, he's got a plus arm, but I mean, we put a 55 hit 60 power on him coming out of the draft. We don't do that with many prep players. Um, you know, I think he was one of the more, prestigious prep hitters in this class. Um, and even guys that typically go for athletes really liked Ralphie. Um, and I think a lot of it is just, it's a high level hit tool and it's a chance for above average hit, maybe plus hit. If it really maxes out plus power, he's already got a lot of juice, um, feel for the barrel. I think it's just a great hitting prospect. And honestly, in this system, you need, you need some impact guys. You know, you need some guys that, that do some damage that don't play second base or shortstop. <laughs> so many, now. so many middle infielders. Um, real quickly, before we don't have much time left, too, but I don't, I don't know if this is even a short conversation we can even have. But Cleveland's got a new scouting director. Do you think that typically when a new scouting director takes over, there's a, ch- a philosophy change? Like, how much do you think really changes when it comes to teams that have a new scouting director after several years? Um, you know, I, I think it depends from situation to situation. So I can't speak specifically on what the guardians situation will be like. Um, but you know, I, I think if it's an, you know, when it, and it's an outside hire, I think we do see 
some change and shake up just within the structure and how things are done between scouting and analytics and some of that that information when it's internal hires more often than not it's just kind of you know making a change somebody moves up in the front office somebody moves on to another job and somebody moves up and there's not a lot of change you know like the red sox frankly have had really just changes in the gm's office and if you look at the rest of their front office for example there hasn't been a lot of change you know um high and bloom might get fired and somebody else might come in but the people that are working under him are very much you know very similar and i think that's probably very similar in cleveland that it's not it's not a sea change level sort of event that it's more going to be small tangible things and you know maybe processes will work a little bit differently and i know i'm talking in generalities but that's sort of how it works behind the scenes and in, in operations it's just like your job they're just dealing with baseball information you know i think people kind of forget that sometimes yeah i think a lot of people too are, are not super well versed in like the draft process and like people think the gm's got a lot of influence and yeah i don't know how that works but i mean that we were just talking about ethan purser and you know he had the, the spino pick and i'm not sure other guys who other guys he is specifically brought in but Curious to see what what things look like with a new scouting director since Cleveland doesn't change them that often. Mm. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, Jeff Ellis, do you uh, have anything else? <laughs> well, I think I, I want to be. I, I, no, I'll just say no because we <laughs> we are up against it. I I do and I want to. And Jeff has been fantastic, and we could easily go for another three hours. I feel like and, and not run out of content. Um, but we, we want to respect his time and we also want to respect having a, a clean end at the end of the show as one of our everydayers pointed out we've been a little <laughs> abrupt of late. So we want to, again, thank Jeff for joining us. If you didn't take something away from this, that's your fault, frankly. Like I, I took things away from this, this discussion. Uh, so make sure you're tuning in. We'd love to have Jeff on in the future. Um, thank you. My takeaway is subscribe us. to baseball America. <laughs> yes. Uh, remember rate and review download all of that jazz it helps and go go guardians go